Facebook Live discussion this morning with GBMC. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm joined by Regina Presley, a doctor of audiology at the, she is the senior cochlear implant audiologist at the Presbyterian Board of Governors Cochlear Implant Center of Excellence at GBMC. How'd I do with that? Fantastic. Got it on there, right? And also, uh, Robert Pullo, who is the recipient of not one, but two cochlear implants. Mr. Pullo, thanks so much for joining us as well. Happy to be here I'm and hear you. I'm excited about this discussion and Robert can hear me talking. So we have some questions for you. We also got a bunch of props mm -hmm. to show you throughout this. But the, the interesting thing about this is uh, that there's been a lot of progress with cochlear implants in just the past few years, right? Right. So cochlear implants began about 30 years ago and it was really just for patients who had no hearing whatsoever. Now we have patients of all ages um, getting cochlear implants for um, assistance with their hearing when their hearing aids aren't doing what they need them to do. Um, and we're doing wonderful things like streaming directly from our cell phones and our televisions and doing all of that directly to the cochlear implant. Okay, Mr. Polo, yes. you have, did you notice that you were having some trouble with your hearing? And, and give us, t talk us through how that process went. Well, basically at the end of my career, uh, I didn't realize I was having as much trouble as people were telling me they were having trouble with me not hearing them. Uh, so it, it got to a point where if you miss a word, you miss the point. And so I was kind of becoming disengaged or not knowing what's really going on. And um, uh, then trying to change my lifestyle or uh, involvement so that I wouldn't embarrass myself. Um, and then ultimately after my career, I became deaf. So you fully lost all, all of your hearing in yes yeah in both yes. ears mm -hmm. and so um, did it, did you go with or did you try um, traditional hearing aids first? I did, and my problem was I couldn't distinguish the words that I was hearing, and all a hearing aid did was to give me uh, loud, indistinguishable noise uh, and words. So that that really didn't help. Interesting. Background noise and all of that was terrible. This is ideal. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Presley, so that sounds like the issue. If, if, the, if the hearing aid isn't working or it's not uh, giving an effective enough improvement, there is this option now. Is that, is that what it's there for? So what's happening is when pa patients are experiencing hearing loss, they're having damage to their inner ear or the hair cells in their inner ear. And as more hair cells die off, there's no medication to rejuvenate those. And so what the hearing aid is doing is making sound loud so that we can get more access to patients. But as more damage is done to those hair cells, all the hearing aid is doing is sending loud sound down into a system that can't capture it and, and use it effectively. So hair cells. Hair cells. That's what helps with the hearing inside the ear. Yeah, so the sound travels down to our ear. We have all these little hair cells that fire off. They send information up the nerve to our brain um, and then our brain interprets it. So our ear detects the sound, but our brain actually gives meaning to the sound. And so it's a very complex system. And so the hearing aids, I mean, hearing aid technology is wonderful. And so if you have enough hair cells to do the work for you, and when we send that information up, we're getting clarity, then that's perfect. Staying with hearing aids is most appropriate. But if we're wearing hearing aids and we have awareness to sound, and just like Mr. Pulo said, I was getting sound, but it wasn't clear, then that's when we need to think about a cochlear implant. And it brings back the, I mean, he, Mr. Pulo can hear me talking, you know, at, it sounds like normal, right? It doesn't sound- Very normal. Yeah, it sounds uh, like normal audio. Even too. with a hearing aid, when I had them, I was, kind of leaning into the person to try to figure out what they were saying. Here, that's not the case. I act normal, I hope. That's incredible. So yeah. how, um, may, and you have a couple models here. Maybe you can take us through what we're talking about because it is, it is surgery to, to have the cochlear implant I installed. Correct. So the cochlear implant is an outpatient surgery. It takes about 90 minutes. If you talk to any of our surgeons, they'll tell you it's a typical ear surgery. Recovery is, is minimal. Um, and so, a uh, patient gets a surgery, they come back for activation three weeks after. So that's just giving time for the body to heal, any swelling to go down. Um, this is the actual implant. If you'd like to see it, that's okay. what goes that. um, into the system. So that big part that you're holding onto yep. is the body that lays just right underneath the skin. Um, and then 
the little tail that you see on the end is what's fed down into that cochlea that we were talking about earlier, those hair cells. And so instead of the hair cells bending and sending off information, that sends out electrical current. So if you think like piano keys, equalizer on a stereo, my job is to adjust that electrical current uh, to Mr. Pulo's liking and try to restore that sound back to him. Are you bypassing an area that's not working we're is bypassing that, those hair cells. Yeah, so it goes, basically, it winds up being the same signal getting to the brain, just in a different way. So uh, it's a different signal, so it's electrical input. So I tell patients often that think about it like a foreign language, right? Your brain is all of a sudden getting this sound, and yes, you know somebody's talking, but if I was speaking to you in French and that's not a language you knew, you'd be like, well, Regina's saying something, but I have no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> that's how it is when patients first start with their cochlear implant. So when a patient gets a cochlear implant, it is a process. We don't turn it on immediately and you understand everything. So we have rehabilitative therapists to help support that learning. So for Mr. Pulo, he has developed language. He knows what, what words have meanings and sounds. For some of our other patients, they've never heard anything, so they need to, they don't know that's a knock. Right. They don't know what a bird sounds like. They don't know vocabulary words. So it's different for a patient who has been hearing impaired their entire life. Right. Right. So, Mr. Pull, I got to ask you now, now that you had it, you've got it installed, you've been through the surgery, um, take us through that process. What was that like uh, relearning how to understand everyone who's talking to you? Well, actually, it's, it's hard work, uh, I think, because you still don't get the exact pronunciation or it doesn't sound like it. you remember it sounding. Uh, and so what happens is you can practice on your computer and it says the words and you repeat them. Uh, or you can have uh, my wife would, would put a little mesh thing in front of her mouth so I wouldn't be reading her lips and, and say the words. And I think there are like seven or eight particular sounds that if you can hear or distinguish all of them, you can hear. Right. Uh, so we, we went through that process and it was a couple of weeks of that. Uh, it really was like a Sunday school picnic. It was not difficult, but you have to pay attention to it. Was your wife uh, pleased or somewhat disappointed that now you can all of a sudden hear her again after all that, <laughs> that time? <laughs> well, I still had an on-off on button I could use. <laughs> she was very pleased and, and, and happy for me. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And herself, because I don't have the television up so loud. Uh, I'm right. not raising my voice uh, unknowingly. Uh, so that, that all works pretty nicely. Well, it is interesting, Regina, how uh, the uh, deterioration in hearing can really affect not just that, but all aspects of your life and your relationships with people. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't just impact the person uh, that has the hearing loss, but communication with your children, your spouse, uh, communication at work. I've had patients say, um, you know, people thought I was a snob or that I was not exactly. friendly, right? Yeah, You've had exactly. this experience yeah. because you just missed information. And so, you know, that's really challenging. I think one of the other important things um, that everybody's seeing is that there are a list of impacts that hearing loss has. A lot of research is being done on the impacts of untreated hearing loss. So increasing depression, our um, risk of increasing dementia as we age because our brain isn't being stimulated. Hmm. Isolation, uh, risk falls. There's all sorts of things that if our hearing is not managed appropriately and our brain doesn't get that input, they can have a really negative impact on our quality of life. Um, be, feel free to send us in some questions here as we watch the Facebook Live discussion. I gotta say, we did get, get a, a comment from a, a viewer here, uh, Jen. It's not a question though, it just says that Dr. Presley is the audiologist, the best in her field. So you're working with, uh, with Jen, and she just wanted to say hello and thank you for all that you've She'll done. be getting her box of chocolates <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, so it, unsurprising to hear that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, for children, because there are people who are, are born without hearing, correct? And then, correct. or others who are young. This is the process the same for cochlear implants for, for younger patients? It is absolutely the same, same implant. They use the exact same equipment. The thing that's most important about children with hearing loss is that we probably don't give a lot of thought to it, but if we're not hearing, we're not developing speech and language. 
which means we can't interact with folks. We don't learn how to read. We don't learn written language. We need to make sure that these kids are getting information quickly. And so uh, right now in the world, there are um, almost 40 million children with hearing loss. Not everybody needs a cochlear implant, but right now in the US, we're only I, getting 50% of those kids with hearing loss to be evaluated for a cochlear implant. What we do know and research shows time and time again is that if we can implant a child before the age of 12 months, you will not be able to tell them apart from their normal hearing peers by the time they hit kindergarten. Wow, that's incredible progress. It, it is, and recent. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Robert, you sound like you've become a little bit evangelical about this. You want people to know that there are benefits to to getting this type of surgery. Absolutely, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to never hear, you know, be born deaf. Mm -hmm. That's extremely difficult. So I focus more on the children because I feel for them and their future careers, having had a career and so forth, and uh, my reaction to the deafness or the losing of the hearing was to withdraw from everything. There's a very active person, very much involved, very much an advocate, but I had to take a back seat because I just didn't understand. and. And uh, like I said, you miss a word, you miss the point. You sit at a table talking about something other than what other people talk about mm -hmm. today. Now, it's like I get directional hearing. I didn't have directional hearing with hearing aids. Uh, things right. got real loud. You get headaches and all of that. This is not that. This is absolutely normal. And so I feel like, um, like I, other people have to turn the television up. Mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. Uh, so. And it's not just for, for mm -hmm. when people are speaking with you. It's, it's all audio, watching the TV, or just right. being out in nature, driving, or being right. in a car. You, right. you hear all the, the right. audio of the world I, now. I, I hear it all, and I gotta say for uh, Miss Regina and, and, and the surgeons who, who do this, uh, they don't uh, change your hearing, they change your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a complete renewal of your presence and your capacity and your ability to, well, communication is everything. Is it, um, do, you, do you think potentially I don't know when, how long you'd been having your hearing loss before you decided to do this, but if you had to go back and do it again, do you think you'd have done it a little sooner, potentially? Um, I, I was kind of pushy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to qualify. Yeah. So I guess I whined a lot, and, and uh, so I got a lot of tests, and I didn't think they were reading the same thing I was experiencing, uh, and they were really generous with their time and, 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 and their listening capacity to, mm -hmm. to, to hear me talk about it. But after I got the first one, I was immediately wanting the second one. Right. Uh, so, so you had two cochlear implants installed, one in each ear, but not at the same time. Correct. Yeah. Um, and is that common? Is that something that happens a lot? It's really about that qualification process. Hmm. So there are guidelines from the FDA of who is approved for a cochlear implant. And so it was really making sure that both ears meet. If, if a patient has the uh, candidacy criteria for both ears, then we certainly can implant. And for really young children, we actually implant both ears at the same time. Just to have it done yeah. right then. Take us through some of the, uh, the, you've got the dolls here to show people, or to show children really, right. explaining what's going on. So um, any of these, so there are three manufacturers in the United States that provide cochlear implants. And this is um, the stuffed animal that the patient would get at the time of surgery. And if you take a look, all of them are wearing some sort of cochlear <laughs> implant, right? So, um, and it does give the parents something to hold on to while the kid is in the operating room. So you, you'll come out and you'll see them hugging. Um, what I brought is there are different types of, we call this external part the processor. So it's really what's capturing sounds, sending information to the cochlear implant. So there are some that are more ear level, like you think of a hearing aid. There are others that are worn just on the side of the head because that internal device that you were holding up earlier has a magnet. We just use radio frequency waves that send that information through the skin and power the implant. So what is uh, implanted? inside and, that, how, and how does that, that work? That piece that you were yeah. holding earlier, this that's the actual implant. I see. So that's the brains or the computer behind the mm -hmm. operation. The external processor is actually capturing sound and then provides all the power uh, to that internal device. Do you ever have to go back in and, and replace this part or is that something that lasts? So the, the internal device is, I mean, we're using a quarter of the capability in that device. I so see. 
in Mr. Pulo's case, what will happen is new technology comes out. He's going to be coming in the office soon. We have some new software updates because um, it is his processor is now compatible with an Android phone. Mm -hmm. So all of his phone calls can go directly. Anything that he wants to stream will go directly to his processors, hands free. Um, great direct sound, better wow. than what you and I get by holding the phone this way, yeah. right? Um, and so to get that upgrade, he comes in, we're going to connect him to the computer, voila, he has that upgrade. Sometimes the external equipment is updated, there'll be a new style, new model, new features, and we just get the new external processor, not really requiring another surgery to replace that internal device. If, if people have questions, should they, do they usually talk to their primary care physician first or um, do they directly start thinking about hearing aids first or do they usually jump right to the cochlear implant? So we state? want to start with hearing aids first. That's part of the criteria because mm -hmm. what we want to do is rule out that there's a, not a non-surgical option. That would be a good choice because if we can meet the patient's needs non-surgically, hearing aids are the way to go. But if they're not doing what they need to, then cochlear implant is really the next step in comprehensive care. Mr. Prola, was it frustrating for you when you, you tried uh, traditional hearing aids? Mm -hmm. And uh, were you hoping to get you know, some improvement from that, and it, it just didn't happen. Exactly. I mean, I certainly was hopeful, uh, and I put all the time and effort into them, right. but they just didn't do the job because the hearing had gotten so so bad mm -hmm. at that point. I just want to make sure there's one thing clear. Uh, that is, that there's nothing inside my ear. Right. That, that's just hanging on my ear, that, that piece. Mm -hmm. And that cord and, and that connector is what it gets it to the hearing device yeah. and that goes to the brain. No one who meets you would know at this point. I mean, unless the, you really Well, look it surprises at people that I even have anything. Well, I'm fortunate enough to have some hair, so. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, <laughs> so it's nice head of hair you got there, well. Ms. Pruitt. Yeah, <laughs> that helps. Wow, it's just incredible. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it has improved? I mean, you're talking about this issue with where it connected to phones and things like that. That sounds amazing but the, the actual devices themselves must be getting better and better every year too. Right, so initially the patients that got cochlear implants had no hearing, they got a very mechanical type of sound, but those patients really were just trying to get sound awareness. Now we're getting speech understanding uh, from the hearing aid. When children are developing their speech and language, it's very natural, it's not robotic. We know the sound that they're getting is good quality. We have connectivity, so um, like this, now you can swim and have hearing. Wow. So, and if you think, well, I don't need to hear while I'm swimming, think about if you're a kid or you're a family member and you're playing basketball or, you know, Marco Polo in the pool, mm -hmm. you need to hear and you wanna be connected, right? So now we have things that are waterproof. Uh, the connectivity, the television, the phone, we have special microphones, so if your kid's sitting in the back of the car, you can clip it back there so their voice will come directly. If I was going to a lecture, I could give it to the speaker, I can sit it here in the center of a table in a restaurant, everything comes right to me. The other um, advance that we have is now we have a combination, so it's a hearing aid and a cochlear implant combined for patients who have better low pitch hearing, but really don't get the high pitches, which leaves them not being able to understand speech and the hearing aid can't bring it up. So now we have that combination as well. And even after the surgery and the, it sounds like it's a process still where you're adjusting and making sure everything is working the way it's supposed to going forward. Kind of like think about physical therapy. If I gave you a hip or a knee replacement, you're not going to run a marathon tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to work on rehab. You're going to go to the gym and then you'll do that marathon. It's the same thing with wow. the cochlear implant. Your hearing came back. Yeah. You, you lost it and it came back. It, so it sounds like a miracle. I believe it is a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are my angels, uh, <laughs> Dr. Regina and, and her surgeon, uh, Brian Kaplan. Wow, what a major improvement in your life. Mr. Polo, thanks so much for coming in. We really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. We're going to leave it right here. Uh, Dr. Regina Presley is the Senior Cochlear Implant Audiologist at Presbyterian Board of Governors Cochlear Implant Center of Excellence at GBMC. Thanks to you both, really, for coming in. Thank this is a lot of fun for me. I learned a lot about cochlear implants today, and I hope everybody else did, too. We're going to leave this discussion up, by the way, uh, on the WMA. Our 2 News Facebook page and the GBMC Facebook page, so if you can watch that again if you'd like. And feel free to send in more questions. We'll pass them along to the doctor. And uh, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christian Schaefer. We'll see you back here on another Wednesday morning Facebook Live discussion on the WMAR 2 News Facebook page.